Is it fair to say that the risks are still on the downside, given all the uncertainties to do with geopolitics as well as the U.S.-China trade war? That's right. Um, notwithstanding the downward revision of our growth forecast for this year and next, we do see uh, risks still weighted to the downside. They include a further slowdown in China, uh, an ex more accelerated trade tensions, um, a reduction in risk appetite in global financial markets, an acceleration in Japan-Korea trade tensions, uh, higher oil prices, uh, and so forth. So a number of downside risks are in the offing. Uh, let's pick up on the deceleration of China's economy. If it does decelerate uh, more than we think, uh, how much risks are there to the rest of Asia? So Asia is a very uh, integrated uh, group of countries. Um, and if you zoom out a little bit from Asia to the whole world, um, you understand that the uh, downward revision in the global growth forecast has really been uh, centered on items like trade, like investment, like manufacturing, which are very much focal points of, uh, of growth drivers for Asia itself. So it stands to reason that um, if, these, if these sources of growth, manufacturing, trade, investment, um, see a further uh, downdraft at the global level, uh, Asia will feel that, um, will feel that at home. Um, now, what is holding up uh, growth in Asia is a proactive policy stimulus on the part of policymakers in the region. We've seen globally that the Fed and the ECB have relaxed uh, their monetary policies, and this has provided uh, a welcome room for Asian policymakers to ease monetary policy, uh, and they have taken advantage of that space. Indeed, uh, 12 of the 14 major central banks in the region have chosen uh, to ease policy, and this has been very welcome. Jonathan, how much difference does more monetary policy accommodation actually make for the structure of many of these economies? People are questioning the efficacy of monetary policy in many developed countries, but what about in developing countries? Surely uh, that's also questionable. So I think that that question is well taken. Uh, I think uh, our point is that monetary policy has been helpful, uh, but that indeed there are diminishing returns uh, and monetary policy can't get the job done alone. Uh, that is why we have said that fiscal policy uh, needs to step up to the plate um, and provide stimulus, which we have seen indeed in a number of Asian countries where fiscal space is available. We have seen uh, governments uh, do more to uh, provide some fiscal stimulus to their economies, working uh, together with monetary policy. The concern about monetary policy continuing to, to uh, take the lion's share of the lifting here is that uh, eventually um, search for yield and financial stability risks uh, become more and more salient. And that puts uh, uh, the goal of, of macroprudential policy to uh, look for where these risks are uh, and to try and proactively respond to these risks. That puts macroprudential policy at center stage. So we, we want to see uh, both uh, a data-dependent monetary policy uh, continue to work we want to see fiscal stimulus um, uh, take uh, some role where fiscal, sp fiscal space is available. But really, we want to uh, encourage policymakers to uh, get to the very source of the problem, which is uh, the, the issue of trade, how to reinvigorate trade, how to get to multilaterally based uh, solutions that address the underlying drivers of the trade tensions in a multilaterally consistent way. 
we want to encourage not just a trade truce, but actually trade peace, because that's the only thing that is going to get Jonathan. rid of the underlying uncertainty and stimulate investment and growth. Jonathan, would you say that even if we do get a trade truce, a peace deal, if you the way you put it here, things are not going to be the same again. It's, we can't just go back to the way things were. Things have materially altered. That's one part of my question. The second part is, who are you most pessimistic about in the region and who are you most optimistic about? So what I would say um, uh, in response to your first question is that, um, no, we, we are not after uh, the way things were because um, the underlying drivers of these trade tensions are genuine issues. Uh, they are issues related to uh, in intellectual property protection, uh, technology transfers, um, state enterprise support, and so forth. So these fundamental issues um, uh, have to be addressed in a multilaterally consistent way, in a way uh, that um, gives support to our multilateral rules-based system. So we don't want to go back to the way things were, but we want to go back to a rules-based multilateral system uh, where investors uh, and firms can be certain about the rules of the game. That's, that's what we want to uh, get back to. Now, um, in terms of the second part of your question, uh, what we have seen is that uh, the, the global uh, outlook for growth has been uh, revised down sharply. Um, Asia being uh, very much at the center of investment, trade, manufacturing, has seen uh, a very similar uh, uh, downward revision in growth. But um, when we look to the future, to next year, say, um, uh, the impetus for the pickup in growth is really not being driven by Asia. Um, and that speaks to the issues that are fundamental to Asia, uh, trade and investment and manufacturing and electronics, where the underlying uncertainties aren't expected to be resolved anytime soon. And so that is really right. what is holding back Asia. And even though Asia is still accounting for some 70 percent of global growth, it is not the engine of the pickup in growth uh, next year in 2020. Uh, Jonathan, Australia, New Zealand and South Korea have somewhat avoided QE, but they've cut rates to record levels. Do you see these three countries still, uh, you know, getting to QE at some point or having to adopt other measures? So let's let's take Australia first. Um, Australia has, as you said, um, uh, undertaken a series of monetary policy easings that have been uh, helpfully providing support to the Australian economy. Uh, Australia has been affected um, by uh, global forces um, through commodity prices, uh, through, uh, you know, its linkages with, with China, which include commodity markets, uh, education, tourism. Australia has also, uh, through its uh, personal income tax cuts, uh, in the current fiscal year provided welcome fiscal support. Um, it has um, uh, decided to sort of manage the trade-off uh, over the next year's uh, budget uh, between its uh, longer-term uh, uh, debt goals and the need to provide stimulus uh, in, a, in a way that um, uh, where the budget is actually slightly contractionary next fiscal year. Uh, what we have said uh, about that is that um, uh, what is important is that if there are further downside risks to growth affecting Australia, uh, fiscal policy needs to step up to the plate uh, as part of a solution in that down, downdraft scenario, uh, especially through uh, measures on the spending side. Uh, Korea um, has um, also uh, being a, uh, a, a very trade, investment, electronics-oriented economy, uh, been significantly affected um, uh, by uh, the downturn in the global economy. 
and, uh, and the downturn in China. Um, what we uh, have uh, Jonathan. seen is uh, a very welcome, proactive response of fiscal policy, but we continue to think that monetary policy could do more in Korea to invigorate the economy.